Daniels. I say, it's Michael McIntyre. And their team captain, David Mitchell. And facing them tonight, she knows who's who. It's Lauren Laverne. He hasn't a clue. It's Graham Garden. And their team captain, Lee Mack. But first, repeatedly bash your manual extremities together for your host, Angus Deaton. Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the only show where you have to spot which of our panellists are cheats, fibbers and downright liars. Uh, one in five people tell lies in the workplace, though if you work at a call centre that figure rises to near a five in five. <laughs> uh, two thirds of all CVs contain lies, most often about age. For example, Jerry Halliwell's CV states she was born in the 20th century. <laughs> And there is a machine that can distinguish between uh, truth and lies. It's called a wife. <laughs> Which brings us hurtling into round one, home truths, where our panellists read out statements from the cards in front of them. As yet, they don't know what's written on the card, a true fact or a whopper of a lie. Ideally, they need quick wits, a poker face, and in a perfect world, the ability to read. So with that in mind, Phil, you're up first. In real life, my next-door neighbour is called Ian Beale. Your next door name is called Ian Beale? Yes. Right. Where do you live? In Gospel Oak. Right. Which is in North London. So it's North London. I live in North London. The Beals of North London. Yes. Yeah. There are four and Beals. Yes? Yes. Who are the others? There's Mrs. Bill, <laughs> <laughs> Brian Bill, and Ian Bill. And is he as wonderfully interesting as the character Ian Bill? Well, he's quite good fun. I drink with him sometimes. He's a postman and he's always in the pub by 12 o'clock in Gospel Oak, the Old Oak. I've been in the Old Oak. Uh, have you been in the Old Oak? Yeah, but I didn't buy a drink there, I left You ran away, room. didn't yes, you? It's quite... Uh, I thought, they don't do it's goat's teeth tartlets here. <laughs> <laughs> no, they drink beer. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> so how did you find out about Ian Beal? Well, I met him in the pub. <laughs> right. And he said, oh, look, oh, hey, you're in EastEnders, and I'm Ian Beal. Oh, right, but he never, he never bothered shouting over the fence this, when he saw you in the garden. No, I didn't know he lived next door to me. Shane McGowan lived there before he did. So this, this bloke followed the strict etiquette of shouting over the fence to people only if he moved in before them? No, no. <laughs> I'm not saying that, am I? I'm saying he told me in the pub. Does the person that live on the other side of Ian Beale, does he talk to him? Over the Who, fence? Sylvester McCoy? No. <laughs> the real Sylvester McCoy or The real got... Sylvester McCoy. Lives next door but one? Yes. Do you know, suddenly, for the first time, I'm starting to believe him. Really? Well, anyone that was lying wouldn't make life harder by going, you I know, I'll stay. I live next door to the old Doctor Who as well, that'll help. <laughs> I can't imagine a postman buying Shane McGowan's house is all I can't get, I can't imagine that. Are we saying it's a lie? Yeah. I think it's a lie. I think it's a lie. I think that it's a lie as well. Okay, they're saying that you're lying, Phil. Truth or untruth? Lie. Hey! It is a lie. <laughs> yep, it is a lie. Uh, Phil's next door neighbour is not called Ian Beale. EastEnders, if you remember, once brought Dirty Den back from the dead, and they've recently done the same thing with Bobby Davro. <laughs> Graham, your turn to astound. I have five pigs, all named after my favourite newsreaders. <laughs> what are the questions going to be here? At, at, this, at this point, we have to ask you which five newsreaders. Can can't we guess them? Can't we guess them? No, we can't. Yeah, Please, can we guess them? <laughs> you, you've, got, like, guess you've got absolutely Ryan no Hanrahan. idea. Ryan <laughs> You, Trevor McDonald's. You, this is just <laughs> this is suicide. Back are you are you working for them? <laughs> this is the opportunity where Graham has to rattle off five newsreaders, no, and I you've just handed no, him four on a plate. No. No, you right. idiot! No, you're right. <laughs> Shall we give him more time? All right. Would you like a pen and paper, Graham? Maybe we should all leave the room <laughs> and they can work on an essay about it. Can I ask? Can I ask? No, you can't. Garden. Silence. <laughs> What are the name of the five newsreaders, please, Graham? What was the first one you said? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, he said Trevor McDonald, and that is one of the one of the pigs is called Trevor McDonald. Well, yeah. Okay. One which you probably wouldn't have guessed is called Jackie Bird, because she's a BBC Scotland oh. newsreader. All right. Do you live in Scotland? Uh, no, but it just looks like a Scottish pig. <laughs> The first one I had um, was uh, called Robert Dougal, 
Do you remember him? <laughs> We're going way back. Quite, quite an old pig then. <laughs> Angela, obviously. She was before your time, probably. Sam. Okay. And my uh, newest piglet is Natasha. Ah. After? After Angela. <laughs> 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 Where do you keep these pigs? Well, they're my pigs. I don't actually have a, a piggery at home, but there's a farm nearby which, which keeps them in the yard. And I go and visit them, and they take care of most of the feeding and stuff, but I go and feed them sometimes. And what do you feed them? Scraps. That's, <laughs> that's the name of my dog. Um. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it was. <laughs> <laughs> so have you met any of the five newsreaders that you've named your pigs after? I've met Trevor MacDonald and Angela Rippon. Have, have you said to them, I have a pig named after you? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> do, do you think this is all adding up? Phil, what do you think? It's um, a lie. I think it's a lie. I think it's true, but obviously the majority rules. But I will yeah. never let it go if I'm proved right. <laughs> well, that's disarmingly honest. Um, yeah. So you've well, effectively got to make a decision. I think you, we're going to say it's a lie. Okay, they're saying it's a lie, Graham. What's the truth? Shameful. It's a lie. <laughs> yes, it is a lie. Graham does not have five pigs uh, all named after his favourite newsreaders. Uh, many newsreaders end their broadcast with an amusing and finally story, as nothing takes the edge off the murder, starvation and war in the world like a monkey riding a horse. <laughs> and lastly, Michael, your turn in the confessional. Oh, I should say, now that I know the rules, I'm going to be all over this. <laughs> I recall that there are, like, tells, aren't there? People have tells, mm -hmm. like when you wink or flay your nostrils or look away, so I'm going to be doing all of them, just in case. <laughs> It's a bit like when we had Harry Redknapp on the show, isn't it? <laughs> For two weeks, I drove a car that could only turn left. <laughs> when you say you drove for two weeks, you mean you, you couldn't stop? It just went on and on, <laughs> turning <laughs> left? Uh, no. I wouldn't like to be the sat nav in that car. Turn right. <laughs> turn right! <laughs> yeah. Will you turn right? <laughs> Why, why could it only turn left? It was hit. Uh, my yeah. wife had an accident in it. So you couldn't turn the wheel right. You had to only go left. Why right. couldn't you turn the wheel right? Because the, the, the metal of the car... Hey, hang on, it's Michael, Michael. Don't get so technical with me. <laughs> the metal of the car, yeah? Can you be more specific? What bit of the metal of the car? The metal bit. <laughs> um, it was the front bit over the wheel was bent into the wheel so you could no longer turn the right. wheel to the right. So at no point in the two weeks you were driving and there was only one way to go which was a sharp right? Um, at, at one point, yes. You're at the corner of a road, sharp yes. right, you're at that yeah. corner, yes. you realise you can't turn right. Yes. Tell me what happens now. You go left, left, left and so left. You can't, you're on a sharp bend to the right, there's no left. I wouldn't have been there because I pre-planned my journey. <laughs> it's very frustrating when you've got to be there and you realise the only way to get there is to go left, left, <laughs> left, left, and left again. That's why it must be very annoying to be a ballroom dancer. Because you've just got to get there, and you've got to go round and round and round. <laughs> and it'd be quite simple just to go plunk. <laughs> Graham, what do you think? I think he's lying. <laughs> Lauren? I think uh, probably lying. We all think as a team that not only is it a lie, Ooh. it's a pretty bad lie. <laughs> In fact, a lie that you should be ashamed of and you should leave the show immediately. <laughs> it's just That's... over there on your right. You might have to go through there, through there, through there. <laughs> well, how do you like I... this? It's true! Get over yourself! <laughs> It is true. Uh, Michael did drive a car that could only turn left for a whole two weeks. Uh, it would have been less, but unfortunately the AA sent out a van that could only turn right. <laughs> uh, when it was eventually diagnosed, it turned out the problem was caused by the nut holding the steering wheel. <laughs> the, um... And so...
to Ring of Truth. Uh, around on the surface, quite simple, but in reality, even easier. I read out some bizarre statements about celebrities, and our teams take turns to decide whether those claims are truth or trash. Uh, David's team are first. Bono once paid British Airways $1,700 to have his favourite trilby flown first class to a oh. concert in Italy. Or did he? Well, I believe that it might cost $1,700 to fly first class on British Airways. Mm -hmm. So that I can believe. It was upgraded. What, why? Um, <laughs> that was upgraded. <laughs> it, it was. It was upgraded to fly in the cockpit. That's not first class, the cockpit. No, it was upgraded from first class. To the cockpit. To the cockpit. You see, that's a. Uh, you see, never buy a first class ticket. You might end up getting upgraded and having to fly the fucking plane. <laughs> <laughs> If he needed it as a prop, then, you know, it's, it's justifiable. No, but it's not justifiable to send it first class. You can put it in the hold, or you can put it in economy. With the scummy hats. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so were they wearing it in the cockpit? I think it was sitting in the cockpit. Because that would freak me out if I was head. waiting for a pl flight and I looked out the window and there's some <laughs> captain with a trilby on. <laughs> 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 I couldn't be dealing with that. What do you think? You don't... I think yes. Rock and roll, you know, people do things like that, you know. I'm leaning on lie. You're leaning on lie, you're leaning true. Yes. I'm going to go lie. OK, and I can tell you it is absolutely true. Oh! <laughs> yep, it is true. Bono did once pay $1,700 to have his favourite trilby flown first class to a concert in Italy. In a totally unrelated story, on the same day, British Airways staff set a new world record for wiping their asses on a hat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, every three seconds, Bono does something annoying. <laughs> uh, Lee's team, you're up next. You may find this slightly strange. Well, I first started reading Bottoms about four years ago at a party. Um, it was a friend's birthday. And because I'm always saying, no, you can read anything. And the guy says, oh, well, read my bottom. And I did do. And uh, made some predictions and they came through. So that was how it started. Your boyfriend, is, is he having problems with his car at the moment? Yeah. Um, he's very enthusiastic about this car as well. It's his happy project, isn't it? His baby, if you like. Do you think I'm on the right career path? I feel your um, management are very impressed with what you've done so far. Because you've clinched some tricky deals. <laughs> Michael, that wasn't your wife, was it, when she said? Is your, is your boyfriend having problems with his car at the moment? <laughs> uh, so here is the uh, related fact then for Lee's team. Uh, Mick Hucknall. Uh, wears trousers called bun boosters, uh, which have a metal lining to add definition to his rear. I don't want to be cruel to Mick, but if you've got a face like that, you're not going to worry about your arse, are you really? <laughs> <laughs> See, I believe that women would have because women are quite open about improving themselves like that, but blokes are, tend to be a bit more no. coy. But you see well, they are made for women, the, these jeans. So he's got the arse of a woman when he wears <laughs> The moment of truth in the bedroom, you know, assuming that this arse actually pulls somebody, <laughs> you know, that's going to be a time when, even with the lights off, you know, they're going to be a terrible clang. When <laughs> <laughs> what do we think? I, I can't imagine it. No. Uh, Graham? I think he did. Do you? Mm. Based on what? Just want to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a lie. And you're saying it's a lie, OK, and I can tell you it is, in fact, a lie. Well done. <laughs> it is a lie. Mick Hucknall does not wear trousers called bun boosters to add definition to his rear. It must be strange to come from the Manchester music scene that spawned Sean Ryder and Bez and still be known as the ugly one. <laughs> uh, which means at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are sitting prettiest, ahead as they are, 3-2. Our next round is the curiously titled This Is My, in which Lee's team all claim to have a special relationship with our mystery guest. Only one of them is telling the truth, and it's David's team's job to go through the charade of carefully interrogating Lee's team before taking a wild stab in the dark. So please welcome this week's special guest person, Roger. <laughs> uh, so, Graham, what is Roger to you? Uh, this is my friend Roger. I presented him with a prize at the Chipping Norton Giant Vegetable Competition. <laughs> uh, Lee, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Roger? This is Roger. Together we ring the bells at the local church. 
<laughs> and finally, Lauren, what's your relationship with Roger? Uh, the, obviously, yes, Roger. Hiya. Yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing because uh, Roger actually removed a tattoo that I had of the Fonz. So, there you have it. A vegetable-growing champion, if we believe Graham, a church-going bell ringer, according to Lee, or an expert Fonz tattoo removal surgeon, uh, if we believe Lauren. David's team, where uh, to begin? Right. Uh, Lee, what's the church? East Molesley Methodist Church. What's a bell ringer called? Well, I'm called Lee. He's no, called no, Roger. What's the I mean, term? We haven't all got the same name. Right. That would never work. What's the term for the practice of bell ringing? Campanology. Okay. What? Is that right? Yes. Weren't expecting that, were you, Mitchell? Yeah. <laughs> Can I just um, ask, Roger, if, I, if you could just turn around a little bit, I'm going to try to read your arse. <laughs> Notice the way you can only turn to the left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a lot from your arse, but yeah. nothing to do with this round. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe you'd like to go back to the so uh, Method bell ringing. A Methodist church with, that, with a yeah. bell tower. Brilliant. That's unusual, isn't it? Are you a practising Methodist? No, or? no, no. I'm, a, I'm an expert. <laughs> um, How many times have you rung the bells with Roger? How many times have you rung the bells with Roger? Probably about... Six times, but, uh, but so I've done it about eight or nine times, ten times. What was it about two and a half months ago that said, I need a new hobby? I, I met Roger. I was at a, a, a neighbour's uh, party and uh, we got chatting. I'd had a few to drink. I started doing what most people do, uh, you know, which is slightly jokingly ribbing him about his hobby. And then he said, well, you should come down sometime and try it. So for a laugh, I did. And it was actually quite good exercise. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. David, would you like to interrogate any of the others? Right. Um, yes. Why did you get a tattoo of the Fonz? It was kind of like a sort of late 90s ironic statement. Uh, like, oh, yeah, that'll be funny. Let's go and do it. You know, we're all kind of at a party, just being daft. And I was like, yeah, you know, brilliant. Yeah, I'm going to do it. And uh, went off and did it. And then obviously thought, I've got Henry Winkler on my thigh for life. How do you remove a tattoo? With a laser tattoo removal. Is it like I imagine? Is it, is there, is it a helmet and big laser guns? <laughs> what, what's, what, is it, what does it look like? No, no, no. I mean, does he like... walk in and go. <laughs> 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 it's like, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the person who's doing it does wear like glasses, like protective glasses, but not like a big welder's helmet or anything like that. And it, it's, uh, it's just like a pulse. <laughs> this, this laser technique for removing it, it's quite, is this quite a sort of surgical, posh, advanced thing? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's not posh. I mean, you've got to pay for it. You know, um, well, I think if you've got... Posh and free aren't synonyms. <laughs> All right, Cambridge boy. Um... <laughs> All right, Sunderland girl. <laughs> Graham, can you tell us about the occasion that, what was it, the chip, Chipping Norton Giant Vegetable mm -hmm. contest? Yeah. What well, do you want to know about it? And what was Roger's um, Well, I, I mean, I, I, uh, Roger has won a prize several years running. Uh, uh, but not always for the same category. Ah. So I know he did win the biggest cucumber one year, and he might have had the longest leak. <laughs> <laughs> and the year, so do you give the prizes every year? I give the prizes out, yeah. yeah. Um. How do you know, Graham, if what? someone brings a sprout and they say this is a really massive sprout, how do you know it's not just a cabbage? <laughs> That has to be proof it's been uh, cut off a stalk with other sprouts on it. At the moment, I the think I'm, in, got the, to I'm in the ridiculous lovely. situation where the massive Chipping Norton Massive Vegetable Contest, which initially sounded like the most made-up thing I'd ever heard, <laughs> is the most plausible of the three. Do you, do you live near Chipping Norton? Yes. Yeah. See, that's plausible. That, <laughs> uh, Phil, do you have a... I would go Lauren. ...thought Lauren. at all? Lauren. Lauren. Phil has said Lauren, and you think Lauren, do you? I do. Uh, I'll change to Graham, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, well, we need an answer. So, David's team is Roger, uh, Graham's ace vegetable champion, uh, Lee's bell ringing chum, or Lauren's tattoo removal specialist? I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with Graham. Well, perhaps Roger would like to reveal his own identity. No. It's Graham. He presented me with two prizes the last year's baseball ah. <laughs> uh,
So Roger has won the Chipping Norton uh, Giant Vegetable Competition. Uh, Roger's cucumbers are grown purely for size at the expense of all taste and texture and are available at all leading supermarkets. <laughs> Roger's longest leak was also up for a prize from the British Innuendo Society, as a result of which they gave him one. So, uh, <laughs> all that means at the end of that round, it's uh, Lee's team who are left licking their wounds behind as they are 4-2. Our final round is, was and always will be quickfire lies in which our panellists are selected rapidly and randomly uh, to lie against the clock, again from a card that they haven't seen before. Time for losers to catch up, for winners to extend their lead and for me to confuse matters further by throwing in occasional possessions uh, which panellists must instantly claim to own. Uh, Lee's team are behind so need quite frankly to get their act together. Uh, starting <laughs> with <coughs> Lee. For six months I cleaned the windows of the Empire State Building. Did you finish? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't finish it. Of course, as we all know, it never finishes. What? It's like the fourth row bridge. No, no, it's taller. Oh, right. <laughs> so when was this in your life? 19, about 1987. Right, and, and why were you in New York? I was just backpacking around America. And you decided, I'll stick here. Well, for I wasn't backpacking around going like that and going... I got the bag at work. Yeah, but why did you stay there for six months if you're backpacking around? You well, might do I had a job, a job for a few weeks. Well, because I ran out of money and then uh, I ended up staying in New York. How long would it take you to do a window? It would take roughly, uh, it would take about an hour, something like that. No, hour per window, no way. I, I feel very much that this is true. Well, I feel very much that it's a lie. 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 They're saying it is a lie, Lee. It is, in fact, a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a lie. Uh, Lee did not clean the windows of the Empire State Building for six months, although the hardest part of the job traditionally has been scraping the huge amounts of giant gorilla shit off the side of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <coughs> David. <clears throat> when I was little, I used to dress myself as an 18th century nobleman. <laughs> yeah, he definitely did. Look at him. Yes. Why? Yeah. Well, um, fun. <laughs> Can you describe what the costume? Wear, yeah. well, well, um, it, it wasn't perfect. Um, <laughs> I, it basically Surprises. involved tucking my trousers into my sort of knee-length socks <laughs> and uh, tying a true. bit of string <laughs> around <laughs> a small mac to make it more like a kind of a tail mac. coat. I'll be honest with you, I could have wandered into a costume drama and people would have gone, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do when you were dressed up? I had a sword. Ah, right. Um, did you have sword fights? Sort of with the air. <laughs> no shield? No, you, they didn't, no, it's not that, in the 18th century, no, that's all wrong. Shield? No. no. <laughs> what do you think, Lauren? Yeah, totally, it's David, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think it's true, yeah. I can just see him in his little mat. Lee? I don't know. It's too, too David. Too, too, too David. obvious, you know yeah. what I mean? I'm reluctant to say yes, but I will go with the team. David? I believe you are telling the truth. OK, David. Uh, well, it is, in fact, true. <laughs> yeah, it is true. Uh, David did dress as an 18th century nobleman when he was little. The 18th century was a vibrant period, richly populated with impressive historical figures. Voltaire, Dr. Johnson, Russell Brand. <laughs> Next, <coughs> Lauren. <clears throat> I got my head stuck in railings three times in the same week. Recently? Or? Uh, no, this is when I was very, very little, quite young. What were you trying to achieve um, through these railings? Well, nothing. I wasn't, like, trying to get to the other side. I'm not a fucking idiot, am I? Well, <laughs> how, long, how long was your head in there? Oh, I didn't, when you're a kid, time flies, doesn't it? It's no, just, quite the reverse. <laughs> when you're a kid, time feels a lot longer. A year when you're, like, That's three true. is a third of all the time you've known. Uh, well, then, <laughs> well, then, yeah, it yeah. felt like ages. 
ages. <laughs> yeah. Did you freak out and scream and cry, or were you sort of calm about it? I think it? I, was, I was kind of like stupid enough to do it, but intelligent <laughs> enough to be embarrassed. So I didn't make too much of a fuss. I was just, oh, God. How old yeah. were you? Like a kid, like a six. <laughs> but five, five. Five, because I don't think I was intelligent enough to be embarrassed when I was five. When, five. So, when I did something incredibly stupid when I was five, I would just happily have cried and shouted and said, <laughs> get me out of this situation, ow, ow, rather, rather than going, oh, I've actually been rather a fool. <laughs> All right, so, uh, David, what kind of decision are you veering well, towards I'm, at the moment? I, I suppose, well, it's, def it's eminently plausible. It is, so, yeah. it? Shall we say true? Um, OK, um, we'll say true. Mm. Yeah. You're saying it's true? OK. Lauren, are you lying through your teeth? OK, it is... True! Yeah. 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 Yes, it is true. Uh, Lauren did get her head stuck in the railings three times in the same week. Still, it made a change from the traditional Sunderland pastimes of dog fighting, badger baiting, and marvelling at electricity. <laughs> uh, uh, next, <coughs> Phil. Possession. Ah, oh, right. You need to look inside your box. Tell us what it contains. <coughs> These are the slippers Sting sent me for my last birthday. <gasps> wow. Ooh. <laughs> Not that cool, <laughs> to be honest. I believed you up to that moment. <laughs> right. Why did you buy your slippers? Because it, in Quadrophenia I had a scene where I wore some uh, slippers similar to that and... Um, no, you didn't. I know that. Oh, though. yes, I did. What, what scene? In the bedroom. <laughs> you don't say. When he was looking at the wall, the pictures of girls on the wall and he had a pair of slippers on. Mm. Yeah, I remember the scene you're talking about and you could be right, but I'm like, oh, kicking myself. Sting was in Quadrophenia, wasn't he? Yeah. It? Yeah. And I did this thing. I went to a signing. Right. And we started chatting about the old times and things happened and he's, I got them as a bit of a joke. He must know you pretty well to give you slippers that match your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, eh? What do you call him? Do you call him Gordon or Sting? Sting, you don't call him Gordon. No, don't you don't. You? No. Don't call him Gordon, it's no. his name. He won't... <laughs> <laughs> he's decided that names aren't good enough for the likes of him. He's gonna, he's gonna take a verb. <laughs> <laughs> that means everyone thinks he's good and no one thinks he's a twat. <laughs> Would you do me a favour? Could you just put one of your feet up on the desk next to the slipper? Would we'll you check the size? Oh. They're exactly the right size. It's got to be true, hasn't it? Very... All right, let's go for true. Yeah, true. They're saying it's true. Put us out of our misery. How would he know my size? It's a lie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. That was very well told. Yes, it is a lie. Uh, Sting did not send uh, Phil some slippers for his birthday. Sting doesn't give out birthday presents as his music is a gift. So let's hope he's kept the receipt. <laughs> Uh, which uh, nasty buzzing noise means that it's the end of tonight's show and I have to tell you that uh, David's team are this week's masters of their own domain having spanked Lee's team 9-3. <laughs> <laughs> So, hurrah to our winners, uh, Yabu sucks to our losers, and I leave you with news that according to scientific research, a common indicator that someone's lying is if they start sweating. Uh, it's also an indicator that someone's got the heating up too high, they're grossly overweight, or they're living in a carry-on film and an attractive young lady's just bent over. <laughs> With their sketch show, the comedy duo Armstrong and Miller, coming up next on BBC One. <laughs>